The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our presentation this morning. My name is Sarah Curran, Marketing Communications Specialist with Eurofins U.S. Food and Seed. I will be on this call today to facilitate, to pitch your questions to our wonderful presenters. And before we get started, I'd like to give you guys a chance to look at our agenda. Everyone go ahead and take a peek at the agenda of the different topics that we'll be covering today. As you can see at the very end, we will have time for a question and answer. We'll take a few questions up until we hit the one hour mark after that. We will have time to answer your questions after the presentation one-on-one uh, -on -one via email. A few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and a recording will be available within one to two days an email will be sent directly to everyone who has registered for the webinar, whether or not they attended. That email will have the slides to download and the digital recording of the webinar. The recording will also be available on the Resource Center for both Eurofins US Food and Eurofins Biodiagnostics. Questions will be answered via email if they are not um, answered directly during the presentation. And you can submit your questions using the question panel in your GoToWebinar dashboard. So if you have a thought during the presentation, rather than jotting it down and saving it for later, you can type it directly into this dashboard and I will pitch it to our presenters at the end of the presentation. At this time, I'd like to take just a few minutes to introduce our wonderful presenters. We have Carol Bechtel, Electrophoresis Department Manager with Europeans Biodiagnostics, Wendy Zilgit, Molecular Breeding Genomic Technology Lab Supervisor with Europeans Biodiagnostics, and Farhad Gavami, Chief Scientific Officer, Agrogenomics with Europeans Biodiagnostics. At this time, I will hand it over to Carol to begin the technical part of the presentation. Just one moment. And Carol, make sure you take yourself off of mute. All right, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. One second. <laughs> All right, good morning. Today we are going to be discussing why genetic purity testing is important. We're going to use corn as a model for most of these presentations, but these processes can be used for many different crop species. So during seed production, some undesired pollination events can occur in either inbred increases or in hybrid seed production. If this is your inbred and you want to increase it, you only want pollen within the inbred field. But if pollen comes from an outside source, you're going to have outcrossing. If you're doing a hybrid, you have your female and your male. If the female is not detasseled or it's shedding some pollen, if it was a sterile shedding pollen, you're going to get selfing. Or also you could get outcrossing from an undesired source. We are testing for these unwanted pollination events. Field growth can be done, but they're time consuming and can sometimes provide unreliable data. Poor growing conditions can mask cells present in the field, and off types may not be visible when you read your growouts, but they can still affect yield or have a later maturity. So genetic purity testing is essential in all stages of production for breeder seed, inbred line increases, and hybrid seed production because a hybrid is only as genetically clean as a parent seed used in production. A benefit of seed production is that it confirms that the seed lots meet genetic purity standards set by the company. This is done by 
identifying selfing and outcrossing that may affect plant uniformity, performance, and yield. Another benefit is to determine variance, segregation, and seed mixes. We will cover these terms in our presentations. For variety verification, we use controls and previous genotyping information to verify that the variety is correct. This is part of our genetic purity testing. For hybrids, parent seed is tested for genotype information that's to verify that the hybrid is correct. To verify a variety, a known is required, either from previous testing or a sample provided for comparison. Otherwise, we would have nothing to verify it against. Now, trait testing is very, very important, but it's not a substitute for a hybrid and inbred genetic purity testing. A seed lot can be tested for trait purity, for example, herbicide resistance or insect resistance, but trait testing alone does not always accurately determine the number of self or outcrosses. Outcrosses could be pollinated by a source with the same traits, and trait testing would not detect these off types, and those off types may have a very different plant type. A seed mix could occur with a very different hybrid that has the same traits but the mix would not be detected with trait testing alone. And a hybrid could actually be labeled wrong, but if the traits were the same, it would not be detected by trait testing alone. So both trait testing and genetic security testing are important to determine the quality of the seed. The benefits for the breeder is the identification of any outcrossing that could be present and it ensures that the inbred selections are pure and free of segregation. That's called the, the lines would be homozygous, and another term for this is that the line is fixed. It assures that the line is pure prior to increasing or producing foundation seed. Again, a hybrid can only be as good as a parent seed used to produce them. So how will genetic purity help the producer? It will provide growers with more consistent crop across variable field conditions. It assures that the seed has met the genetic purity standards with minimum self or off types. It gives farmers more stable yield performance. And it will produce uniform visual and non-visual plant characteristics. Tall off types are objectionable and small plants may be self. Non-visual off types can affect yield and it can reduce or eliminate customer complaints. Genetic purity testing ensures that the genetic quality of the seed is good and verifies that the variety is correct. The genetic purity data would support the purity of the sample if a severe stress in the field results in plants that are stunted or poor yield that may not look on type when they really are, but are affected by the severe field condition. Now that I've discussed the benefits of genetic purity testing, we will proceed with discussions of the testing methods. Farhad will be giving the next presentation. Hello all. Uh, just to, like in this section, I'm going to uh, talk about different technologies available for testing the purity of a seed lot or identification of a variety. Here, I would like to discuss what we consider a good purity panel for such applications. Besides the field growouts, all the genetic purity tests available are using protein-based or they're using DNA-based molecular markers. In the last three, four decades, different molecular markers developed for plant breeding purposes and subsequently used for downstream applications in production. And as you see, I mean, a good molecular markers for breeding should have like a consistent results, should be abundant in the genome and should be sensitive for detection. And because of that, molecular uh, marker like microsatellites and single nucleotide polymorphism or SNPs are more popular today. Before we go deep into designing a purity panel, I would like to talk about some uh, plant breeding terminology. Consider the uh, diploid species like sunflower, as you see here. So in, let's say in sunflower, when we have a chromosome, it has a pair in the genome. 
So because of that, they are called homologous chromosomes. And if, you know, these homologous chromosomes are identical to each other, like this scenario or this scenario in P2 pan 2, they are called inbred lines. However, if we cross two inbred lines, then we have an individual, which we call it hybrid, and in hybrid, one chromosome is coming from one parent, and the other chromosome pair, which is just like another homologous chromosome, is coming from the other parent. As the alleles of each homologous chromosome are the same in the inbred, like when you see it here, we call it homozygous, because they are identical in both homologous chromosomes. However, if they are different, like this situation in the hybrid, we call it heterozygous. Another important thing is segregating markers. For example, in parent one here, you see that one of the markers or one of the genes or alleles is in a heterozygous situation. And because of that, in next generation, you see that this allele is segregating. And because of that, we have hybrids that they are different from each other, and they are carrying different alleles of a gene. Another terminology that I would like to talk about is backcrossing. Backcrossing is a common practice in plant breeding. Usually it's used to bring a trait of interest from a donor parent like this, and we bring the trait of interest, which is, can be a biotech trait or a native trait, to a recurrent parent, which is a well-established commercial line. And when we do that, we get the hybrid, and we cross the hybrid again to the recurrent parent to increase the amount of the genome from the recurrent parent, which is red here. So, and nowadays with molecular markers, we can just detect which backcross one F1 generation individual has more genome from the recurrent parent, like this situation here. And then we cross this one again with the recurrent parent. And we can just do it several times to get to the back cross 2F2 or back cross 3 or back cross 5 sometimes even, to have an individual, individual like line B that is close to line A completely, but has this section, the blue section that you see here, from the donor parent. If you are going to differentiate from line A from line B, <clears throat> which we be call sister lines or isolines, we need to have markers exactly on the blue section or the section that is coming from the donor parent. Before uh, we, like, uh, before we, we design a purity panel, we have to, like, do a deep genotyping of the breeder seed line. So here you see that like the first step in designing a, a good purity panel is just we have a high density genotyping of uh, the parental lines or all the line, all the breeders lines in a company. <clears throat> here is an example of genotyping these eight lines with uh, SNP 50K array. And you see that there are different markers, 50,000 or 56,000 markers available on this array, and because of that, we can just genotype or fingerprint all the lines by that. And then we can look at each marker and just pick the markers that they are polymorphic. Here, this marker is monomorphic, but if you see this marker is polymorphic, so we can just select those markers because these markers is segregating and is polymorphic in the population. The second step would be selecting the markers with high minor allele frequency. So here, after that, we select the most informative markers from the high minor allele frequency markers. The, high, the, mark, the minor allele frequency markers that they are around, the, the frequency of them are, is around 50.5 or 50% in the genome, uh, in the whole population, we select those, and th then we select the informative markers that, for example, the markers that they are not, they are not associated to, together or the markers that they are in the telomere region, or the markers that they are coming from all the chromosomes. So when we select the most informative markers that way, we convert the markers based on the SNP sequence, uh, and, and we convert them to the PCR-based markers. So 
So those markers from the array or hide and see array or sequences that are available will be transferred to PCR based markers. And then we select the markers with the best quality for the genetic purity panel. And those qualities should be a PCR quality. If the PCR quality is good on those markers, we select those markers for a panel. And then we validate the panel in silico. And after in silico validation, we validate the panel on a number of random lines to find its efficiency. Here, you can see that, uh, the, the, that we validated the corn SNP 16 uh, the panel and corn 18 SNP panel. And you can see that the corn 16 SNP panel can separate 90% of the 517 publicly available line we screen. The corn 18 SNP panel, because they have two more SNP markers on them, can separate 95% of the 517 publicly available lines we screen. Here, I'm going to show how we validate the, the, the panel in, uh, in the lab, in the wet lab in real life. Here is an example of seven markers and six different inbred lines. First, we have to make sure that these panels can separate the lines from each other. And most importantly, they can separate the male from the female. And as you see here, the BDI1, BDI3, and BDI5 marker can separate line one male from one line female. And because of that, they are very good markers for detection of the hybrid versus the female. The other markers that you see here will be good to separate different lines from each other. So they are really good for separating the mixes or outcrops. Here uh, we have the, uh, an example of uh, uh, nine SSR markers for variety ver verification or identification and hybrid uh, purification. So you see that uh, here in these SSR lines in cucumber, uh, we can just see that you know some of these SSRs can separate the female one from the male one, and they can detect the hybrid. In SSR markers, the size of the band or the size of the product, PCR product, is important. So what number you see here is the size of the PCR products on the gel or on the uh, fragment analysis machine. So here you see that we see, segregate, we see differences or polymorphism in the size of the markers. And because of that, they are good markers to detect the hybrid. So these markers can be used for purity purposes as well too. Here you see that this marker B4 can separate the uh, female two from the male two and, and the same way they can just uh, detect the hybrid as well too. And even with these markers that we mentioned here, we can separate the female male one from the female and male number two. One of the important things that I'm going to mention here is just, uh, in, in, is just in purity panel, most of the purity panel would be good for uh, varietal verification as well too. But if we are going to see if two lines are identical to each other. Then we have to use a high density panel or we have to use an optimal panel, which means that they have to have a good number of markers all over the genome to be able to detect uh, if two lines are identical. If not only, we can just say that if an unknown line is similar to line A or line B, we cannot say that the unknown is just identical to line A. Another important thing that we should always remember is one marker differences in genetic purity panels should be translated to a bigger differences in the genome. For example, you see here that we cross this female with male and get this hybrid. If all of a sudden these females outcross to this male, which is just a foreign panel, foreign pollen coming to here and just uh, cross to this female, then all of a sudden you see these outcross. And these outcross is only different from your hybrid with three different markers that you see here. But you see that half the genome is different from the other one. So one marker or a few markers means a lot in purity panel. So the take home message from uh, this small presentation is Molecular markers provide a good measurement for purity and variety identification. 
and the evaluation is fast and not get affected by the environment, so they are a good source for QA. And the SNP markers are one of the best markers because millions of them are available in the genome. They are easy to detect and produce consistent results. However, the efficiency of a purity panel depends to its process of development. And the number and selection of the markers in purity panel are important for detection of outcrosses and seed mixes. To know if two unknown seeds are identical, we need a higher density of molecular markers, and just the purity panel in, uh, is not enough. So no, I'm going to go uh, just just leave it to Carol to talk about isolam electrophoresis. Thank you, Carol. So I will be discussing the isothymy electrophoresis process for genetic purity testing. This is a protein-based technology. That's important to remember. This is protein versus DNA. And it's a powerful tool to detect selfing and outcrossing. So what is isozyme electrophoresis? Well, it's a process where we use electricity and your proteins that we get from our plant tissue. That's inserted in your matrix, which is our gel. And this results in separation of molecules after a period of time. And banding patterns become visible when the enzyme stain is applied. So your sample is put in here. You have a negative charge, a positive charge. The electricity runs through. The gel acts as a sieve, and the molecules move through the gel and separate in that electric field. So this is showing you that individual seedlings are having proteins extracted out of them. And it is, will be inserted in this gel. Electricity runs through and the proteins will separate. So when electrophoresis is complete, the proteins are separated into similar groups in the gel based on their size, shape, and charge. These groups aren't visible in the gel, so the gel needs to be sliced, and each slice is stained with a solution that causes a chemical reaction and produces a visible color. We can't use a total protein stain on a starch gel. Each slice is stained for a different enzyme system. When the solution is added to the gel, the location of that particular enzyme appears as bands. And these banding patterns are like fingerprints. A variety of corn always has the same banding pattern. So this is a picture of the white gel. Uh, the chemical is applied. In this case, it's ACT, acid phosphatase. It's poured on the gel, and then those particular uh, protein bands will appear. This is the maize chromosome map. Here at EBDI, we use eight different enzyme stains, and these have 16 different loci or markers. So those locations are circled on this map. Some of the stains have more than one locus. So you can see IDH1, IDH2. So IDH has isocytic dehydrogenase has two loci on two different chromosomes. These isozymes that we do have proven to be very polymorphic for different corn lines. Polymorphic means that for a locus, different varieties have different banding patterns. These differences are necessary if we want to detect selfing and outcrossing. So it's important to remember that each slice has all of the proteins but the chemicals in the solution stain protein-specific bands. Some of these other proteins can be stained, but some don't have very many different banding patterns, and they're not as helpful. But now we want to evaluate our gel. So on the left, you can see we're looking at selfing. Um, it's important to remember these two slices are from the same gel, so these are the same individual in each slice with different chemical um, enzymes applied. So for a female self, well, for selfing, ideally you have two or more loci. You can identify them with one, but ideally you have more. So in this case, we are showing two loci, and this band and this are identical to the female. And so all of these are marked as female cells. A variant is different at just one locus, just one of our 16 markers. That's marked there. An off type is different at two or more. So in a hybrid, an off type would not be the same as a hybrid, and it's not the same as a female, so it's something else, and that's called an off type. 
We also look for contamination, or we can find seed mixes, and it does not have the genetics in either parent. And in this case, for isozymes, that's very easy to see when it's not either parent. So in this case, they're hybrid. The female has what's called the 3-3 pattern, the male a 4-4. The hybrid's a 3-4, which is this right here. Here we have an individual that's a 2-2. Genetically, that's not possible, so we know that's a seed mix. In an inbred, this is very visible. Uh, this is the IDH2, that's the 4-4. Here's the 6-6. Genetically, that can't happen, so we know that's a seed mix. Sometimes seed mixes are detected in hybrids because the off types don't have the female band present. And so that can indicate a seed mix because genetically they can't be outcrosses. So that's another sign there can be a seed mix. So I just want to point out these banding pattern names. You'll see this 4-4 and this 6-6. Six, six. So these are identifiers assigned by researchers. So years ago when I saw these numbers, I thought, what in the world do they mean? But there's simply nomenclature that identifies the banding patterns, which are based on migration distances in the gel. So I'm going to talk about segregation. So it's variation in a population at one or more locus. So what you're going to have uh, down here is segregation on MDH malate dehydrogenase. So within the population, I want to point out each of these lines is one individual. So some individuals have one homozygous type, some have a different homozygous type, and then some will have a heterozygous type. We don't subtract segregation from the percent total purity because we say it's part of that line and we can't say which type is wrong. So we just make a note that that line segregates, that it's not fixed. A breeder seed purification can get rid of this segregation. So we would test 10 seeds per ear and in this situation, some of the ears should be 6-6, and some should be 3-3, three, three, and some likely will still be segregating. And so we will let the breeder know that there's two different types, and then they can decide which of these two lines they want to increase. Or they could increase both, but they would need to call them a different line. And they can discard the ears that are still segregating. Segregation may not be visible in a field environment and may be hard to select out. But that segregation could affect hybrids if a segregating inbred was used in production. So ideally, segregation would be eliminated. This is an example of the report we have at EBDI, your results report. And the next slide, I'm going to blow this up a little bit more so you can see it better. But you're going to have your variety information on your left and your purity data on the right. So it's the number tested, and the percent total purity is going to be 100 minus the total cells minus the total off types. At EBDI, we classify our off types as percent 2 loci and percent 3 loci. Percent 2 loci means it's incorrect at two of our 16 markers. Percent 3 loci is at three or more. And then the total off types is a combination of the two. So it's 100 minus itself, minus the off type. Variants typically are, not, we don't subtract them from the 100% purity. Variants are thought to be part of the inbred or the variety line and may not be visible in a field, so we don't subtract them. They could be in, from impurities in the present seed. Um, if you're testing a hybrid and you have tested your inbreds and the inbreds have variants present, Unless you're able to rub them out in the field, those variants are still going to be present in the hybrid, but we don't subtract them. However, if you've tested your inbreds and there were no variants and suddenly in your hybrid you're seeing a very high level of variance, that could be a red flag that you might have to look at that hybrid a little closer for some source of contamination. I also want to point out that segregation. This is 100%. Um, the first part, it says that this segregates, and here it says the segregation was not recorded. So even though this says it's 100%, it's important to look at these comments because that can note that that line still is not fixed, and you may want to work on getting that cleaned up if you can. So the application for hybrid purity is to detect cell feeding and outcrossing and seed mixes. Typically, for seed sizes, well, it's really recommended to, to test by sizes and not just a 
box size. If um, a bulk stamp might not give the true picture of the seed lot. So for example, just um, you might have 2% off types in your bulk, but those off types could be concentrated in the large round. And so the large rounds might have, for example, 10% in your other sizes would have none. So ideally, you would test by more than one seed size. And for inbreds, we can detect outcrossing and seed mixes. And verify the correct variety. So we, it's compared to a non-standard or control. We always check this when we test if we have previously tested the variety. So even when we do hybrid in red purity, we always verify it's correct if we have previously tested it. Uh, so we use it in breeder seed to eliminate segregation as I have previously mentioned. And we can get the results in about two weeks, which would replace winter grow out. So it can be done in a fairly quick time. And I actually skipped this part. So the verification is a plant tissue. Um, if there's a complaint, you might have some off types in a field that look very unusual. We can test the plant tissue and to see if it actually is the correct variety. So applications also. So there are other crops that we can test here at EBDI for sunflowers. These are four of the stains that we do. So we can do sunflowers. And we can do canola and brassicas and sorghum and, and pumpkin and squash. And we do research on other crops once in a while too. So in conclusion, isozyme electrophoresis is a very useful and powerful technology to detect genetic purity in crops. Now the next presentation will be given by Wendy Silvet. Hello and good morning. As Carol mentioned, my name is Wendy and I'm really excited to talk to you today about genetic purity testing using DNA-based molecular markers. There are some fundamental terms and concepts I would like to touch on before we begin discussing DNA-based technologies. When we talk about DNA testing, you will frequently hear the term genome. A genome is the complete set of genetic material that is found in an organism. The composition of a genome consists of nucleotides. And to break it down one step further, the nucleotides in DNA are designated as A, C, T, and G. Variations that are found in nucleotide sequences are unique to an organism. So let's begin our discussion on DNA-based molecular marker testing. There are two common DNA-based technologies in use today. They are SSRs which is an acronym for simple sequence repeat. They're also referred to as microsatellites. An SSR is a section of DNA consisting of very short nucleotide sequences that are repeated many times. Another newer technology used is SNPs, which stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. The easiest way to explain a SNP is by using the diagram below. In the diagram, depicting organisms one through four, notice that all the nucleotides, and remember the nucleotides are designated as A, C, T, and G, they follow the same sequence pattern except in organism number four, where there is a G. That is a SNP. So a SNP is a variation of a single nucleotide that occurs at a specific position in the genome. Both SSRs and SNPs can be used for genetic purity testing. However, because SNP testing is a newer technology, we will be focusing on that. SNP marker purity panels will be designed that can accurately determine the genetic purity of hybrid and inbred lines through selfing and off-type detection. The purity panel will typically contain at least one SNP marker difference or variation per chromosome. SNP markers that are highly polymorphic within the testing population are chosen. SNPs, as well as SSRs, can also be used for variety verification. Variety verification testing has increased in demand as it has proved very beneficial in resolving customer complaints. Some of those customer complaints we've seen are like, what seed is in a mislabeled bag? Uncertainty of which variety is planted in a field and mislabeling of storage bins. 
This slide depicts the crops that we currently have SNP genetic purity panels for. These purity panels are regularly used by our customers. We are continually de developing purity panels for new crop based on customer demand. We have recently designed a purity panel for onion, which is not listed on this slide. So now let's talk about how a sample is prepared for testing. Corn is going to be used as an example, but other agronomic crops will follow similar procedures. When we test for hybrid purity, the hybrid seeds, as well as the inbred seeds used in the hybrid's production, will be planted on moistened germination towels. The towels are placed in germination chambers. Once the corn has germinated and the seedling reaches the stage, as shown in the image on the bottom left, the leaves are harvested. The harvested leaf tissue is dried in a lyophilizer, as pictured on the right. There are certain crops like tomato and sunflower, where we don't have to germinate the seed. The DNA from these crops can be extracted directly from the seed. When the leaf tissue is dry, it is sampled using a round punch. The amount of leaf tissue needed is really minimal. The leaf disc sample size is only about four millimeters in diameter. The punching device is cleaned with bleach in between each sample to prevent cross-contamination. One leaf disc is inserted into a single matrix tube. Typically, 90 individuals are sampled and plated for hybrid purity. Also included in the testing are tissue samples from the female and male inbreds used in the production of the hybrid. When all the individuals have been sampled, an extraction method is performed that will release the DNA from the sample tissue into a solution. Once the DNA extraction is complete, the sample is ready for PCR. PCR, or polymerase chain reaction, is used to reproduce or amplify selected sections of DNA for analysis. The testing platform used for this is the Array Tape, Pla Array Tape Platform, or ATP for short. The ATP is manufactured by Douglas Scientific, which is a division of LGC. The ATP platform is designed for high sample throughput. The ATP platform consists of three pieces of equipment. I will briefly discuss each of them. The next R machine is the liquid handler. It will dispense the necessary PCR components of sample DNA, SNP markers, and master mix into individual wells on a flexible 384 well array tape. The array tape is pictured on the right. The Nexar will automatically seal the array tape. As mentioned, the Nexar is a high sample throughput machine. So listen to this, it has the ability to dispense up to 10,000 data points per hour. It truly is high sample throughput. The Nexar collects the sealed array tape on spools as pictured on the left. The Solex on the right is a huge programmable thermocycler with three water bath chambers. The sealed array tape is attached to an arm inside the Solex. Based on the required PCR program needed, the Solex will navigate the array tape spool in between the three water bath chambers, each of which are at a different temperature for varying lengths of time until PCR is complete. When the PCR is finished, the array tape spool is removed from the Solex. The array tape is run through the Araya, as is pictured here. The Araya is a fluorescent imaging system that reads the fluorescing dyes in the amplified DNA. Using Douglas Scientific's Intellix software, the SNP markers used in the genetic purity panel can be scored based on the sample DNA amplification and resulting fluorescence. Below is an example of what SNP scoring looks like. Each SNP marker is scored by a trained analyst and then verified by another trained analyst. Auto scoring is not used. The allele calls for the SNP markers have been added to the circled clusters to help visualize the grouping you normally see in hybrid genetic purity testing. Typically, there will be two homozygous groups corresponding to the inbred parents. 
one parent group is scored GG, and the other parent group is scored AA. The allele calls for the hybrid are labeled AG. Now, this is a busy slide with lots of information, but I'm going to talk you through it. So this is an example of a genetic purity report in Excel format that each customer would receive. Within the customer report, there will be a separate tab for each variety tested. What you're looking at now is an example of one of the tabs. Along the top are the names of the 16 SNP markers used in the corn purity panel. Underneath the SNP marker names, each variety will have the expected genotype listed for the hybrid, the female, and the male. Polymorphic markers for the hybrid variety are highlighted in green. There are six of them. The main content of this report shows the allele calls in ACTG format for all the individuals tested. The summary table on the right will also be on each tab. It will include the number of individual samples, which lists 90. There was one ignore, and ignore is when there are four or more no calls. One female self was detected, which is individual number three highlighted in pink. Now this is important. If you look at the allele calls for the polymorphic markers on individual number three, they match the female inbred allele calls. A female self in a hybrid must match the female inbred genotype exactly. Also in this example, one variant was observed, which is individual number seven, which is highlighted in orange. A variant is when there is only one marker difference. Additionally, there was one off-type detected, which is individual number nine, which is highlighted in red. An individual is classified as an off-type when there are two or more marker differences. Now note, this individual does contain female alleles, but it also contains two allele calls that are not female. Those are AG, which are highlighted in red. That makes the individual an off-type. The last piece of information is the number of samples that tested as a true hybrid, which are 87. Note the variants are not subtracted when calculating the true hybrid number. Here is an example of what the front page called the report summary would look like on a genetic purity report. It will give an overview of all the testing that was done, such as the customer name, the extraction plate numbers, the date samples are received, and the date testing was completed. The genetic purity results from the separate tabs that I mentioned earlier for each hybrid and inbred tested will be summarized in the table. The table also includes the percent call rate for each variety tested. Here is an example of a varietal verification report. The genotypes of unknown samples can be compared to known samples. In this example, we determined the genotype of the unknown sample matched the genotype of known A. So in conclusion, DNA-based molecular markers are a highly accurate, fast, and customizable technology for genetic purity testing for virtually all crops. Thank you for your attention, and now Farhad will conclude our presentation. So now that we know about all of these technologies, then the question is which technology to use? The technology that you should use depends to the amount of the genetic information that is available and the level of the seed purity you're looking for. Whichever technology you're going to use, it's very beneficial to use the same technology for both the breeder seeds and production seeds that you're producing. Both protein-based isolam electrophoresis and DNA-based technologies can detect selfing or female cells in hybrid seeds and the hybrids. Isotime electrophoresis and DNA-based technologies both test uh, markers from multiple chromosomes, so because of that, they are good for detecting the outcrosses and mixing. However, because SNP purity panels, they come from lots of data and lots of information from the genome, so because of that, they are producing highly accurate results. 
If you're going to compare two common methods like isom electrophoresis and DNA-based testing, especially SNPs, we could say that both methods are high throughput. However, isozymes, at the moment, they are lower cost and they, pr uh, they, they produce good accuracy. However, for variety identification, the SNPs markers can be more uh, ideal. And the, those DNA-based markers, they work on all tissue and seeds as, as or as you can just extract DNA. So because of that, they are very flexible there. And the loci that we choose for those panels usually come from all chromosomes and uh, produce more reliable data and accurate data for mixes and like, let's say, for, for uh, variety identification uh, and can be easily customized as well too. Uh, the, the, the good thing about you know, DNA-based testing is just trade testing can utilize on the same platform as them as well too. So that sometimes makes it more, uh, uh, I would say, useful. In conclusion, we can say that genetic purity testing is a fundamental component of a good QA program. And the genetic purity of any commercial agricultural product that you propagate by seed depends on the purity of the seed itself. If you plant the seeds that they are not that much pure, then your product in the field is not pure. If you, uh, the, if you use the, your, the good purity program uh, in, your, uh, in your field or, you know, uh, and in your production, then the farmer would, would, would use the, the high quality seeds that they produce great uniformity in the field and they, they have plants that they perform very well and they are very consistent in the field. And ultimately, you can increase your yield and increase your performance uh, for the quality as well, too. Accurate genetic purity testing tools today are available, and you can just um, choose them to use. And the, the, the main message here is the accuracy of any DNA-based purity panel or any purity panel highly depends on the concept of the panel and how you develop those panels. Thank you so much for your attention. All right, thank, thank you, Farhad, and thank you to all of our other presenters as well. Um, like I said in the beginning, we will have time for question and answer. Uh, it is not too late to submit your questions. Go ahead and do that at the um, bottom of your dashboard in the question panel. You can type those in, but we did have a few, come, a few come in early on in the presentation, so I will pitch those up to our presenters now, and we'll just get to as many as we can. Um, if we do not answer your question, please know that we will follow up with an answer via email. So our first question is, um, in which case or occasion would you use the isoenzyme instead of the molecular markers? I can start by answering that. If you have, are strictly looking in for isozymes, if you just need selfing and outcrossing, um, that's, and you're not worrying about the traits, that would be a good method. If you aren't producing your own um, inbreds, if you're purchasing an inbred, you might want to see the purity of that and you're producing a hybrid, and you just need to do selfing and outcrossing, it's very useful for that. But if you want to develop a line from the beginning, I'll turn that over to Farhad. I would think that's when you would want to use the, the DNA base. Do you agree? Yes, I mean, if, if you're looking for like uh, finding the, the, the outcrossing with other like varieties in the field, you know what I mean? Not your own like material or your inbreds, so, and uh, then, you know, a SNPs panel can be, have some advantage. If not, I mean, I just, I'm most of the time produce accurate results. Any other question? Yes. There's another question. Um, someone asked, Farhad, can you define identical and what confidence interval? So, good question. Uh, you don't know how much confidence is there, but as you know, uh, because it's, it's different in different crops. But in corn, usually 
if uh, we run a really high density markers, sometimes we use the 50K, sometimes we use the corn LD, let's say, which has 3,000 markers. Or, or I would say if you like to use 784 markers and more, which is uniformly distributed through the genome on all chromosomes, then 95% similarity is a good similarity for detection of identical material. But really it depends on different crops. All right, thank you. And then one more question. What do you believe would be a good number of individuals to sample a production field with SMP's purity panel? So to answer that one, I would say the more sample is always the, the more accurate result. Usually, I mean, by, by 92 inbreds, for example, you get close to like 95%, 96%, you know, inter I would say that, you know, I mean, um, confidence. But uh, for sure, I mean, there are some companies that, you know, they're using like 180 or 180, you know, two plates, I would say 180, uh, four or 180 material, which is just more accurate. But the minimum would be just 90, 92 that we are, we are recommending. All right. I do see a few questions um, about whether or not you will, whether or not attendees will receive the presentation after the fact. Uh, you will all be emailed a digital recording of this presentation as well as the slides. There were also a few questions about pricing. We will address um, pricing questions offline individually with the people that have asked those questions. So thank you very much for submitting. At this time, I'd like to wrap up and thank you everyone who submitted questions. We will answer your questions offline after the presentation via email. But first, before we wrap up, I'd really like to thank our presenters, uh, Carol, Wendy, and Farhad. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your expertise. If anyone would like to get a hold of Carol, Wendy, or Farhad, here's their email addresses um, and a telephone number so you can contact uh, Eurofins Biodiagnostics main office. At this time, I will conclude the presentation. Thank you everyone once again for attending and sharing your time. Have a wonderful day.